I think you've scared them quite severely with this Rubik's Cube image of my brain, and at least you've scared me. But what a great day uh, to be here after many, many years of thinking about uh, this kind of an enterprise, and now to have this group of remarkable experts uh, gathered here in, in the Porter Neuroscience uh, Center to talk for a day and then another day about how we might take this framework now put forward by no less than the President of the United States and turn it into something much more specific, much more actionable, uh, much more transformative. Uh, and that's really what we're all about. So I hope we can pull out of your brains in the course of the next couple of days uh, every kind of creative insight that you might bring to this, because we have a lot of work to do uh, to take what has emerged as a nascent, compelling, exciting, promising idea and, and turn it into something that we can actually push forward and uh, hold ourselves accountable and, and derive out of this insights into health and disease that we've waited for for a long time. Yes, it has been quite a ride uh, to get here, and I must say, when you've been at NIH, as, as I have now for more than 20 years, it's still a little hard to know how things get started and how they catch momentum. And certainly, even on January 20th, as uh, we were all gathering around televisions to see what the president was going to say, I didn't know what he was going to say. We were led to believe that the topic of precision medicine might come up, or then maybe it wouldn't, and then maybe it would. Well, here's what really happened. So tonight I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring Ooh. us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes and to give all of us access to the personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthier. We can do this. Now please note, both sides of the assembly are standing up. That didn't happen a lot that night but it happened then. So you might say, okay, uh, the speechwriter obviously got those words in there. Uh, did the president actually have some personal interest in this, or was this somebody else's uh, insertion into his speech? Well, just a few days later, uh, Secretary Burwell came to visit NIH, and she did a town meeting, and uh, she and I sat on the stage, and I asked her some questions about this and that. And one of them was sort of, what was her view of how the president views NIH? And her response was actually pretty interesting. But with regard to a couple things about the president, two things that I think are important to know that could help you uh, in your day-to-day -day work. The first one is, and I'm sure you've told the team this, the precision medicine thing, that's him. This is like a presidential priority. This is... The amount of time that is being spent on this issue by the President of the United States relative to, I could go through a whole list of issues, is, uh, is incredible. And so what you should know and what you should take from that is this is his own personal interest. It is what you all do. It is he believes so much that this is about our nation's innovation in science. He believes this is about our economy. He believes this is about the health and welfare of our people. And so this, while it's precision medicine, it is, a, I think, it gives you a view into his thinking about the work you all do every day. Well, okay. <laughs> now he expects us to deliver on that. No pressure, people, but... <laughs> It does seem that we have been given an, an amazing charge uh, by somebody who is deeply, deeply convinced that this is uh, one of the most important scientific enterprises that can happen right now during uh, his administration. And uh, I can certainly vouch for that as well, having the chance uh, to speak with the president several times over the course of the last year about this and sensing his growing enthusiasm. But, of course, uh, the full exposition of what uh, the president had in mind uh, didn't happen on January 28th. It happened on January 30th. I won't show you any more videos, but here's one of the things that he said in that event in the East Room where the rollout of what precision medicine was supposed to be all about uh, got described uh, in, in, I think, very stirring terms. One of the greatest opportunities for new medical breakthroughs we have ever seen. Okay, that's a big charge and one that we need to live up to. Now, having um, some idea that all of this was going to be rolled out, Harold Varmus and I 
tried to write something that would be a citable piece in the literature about what really the Precision Medicine Initiative is about. And I suspect many of you had a chance to see this when it appeared online the same day as the uh, White House rollout, describing the two components of this, one focused on cancer and one on this cohort, which is our main reason to be gathered here for the next couple of days. So let me say a little bit more about what is envisaged here in terms of the outlines of this and a little bit of speculation about where it may take us over time if this all comes together in the way that we hope. Uh, by the way, if you want to sort of follow what's happening from NIH's perspective in this area, that is a website which we will continually be refreshing and updating and putting additional uh, bits of information there. So the concept of precision medicine is not new. Let's be honest here. When you go to get your eyes checked, you don't expect to get a generic pair of glasses. You think it ought to be something that actually helps you see. Uh, likewise, if you're getting a blood transfusion, at least any time after 1915 or so, you would expect there to have been some cross-matching so that you had an opportunity to get a unit of blood that's going to help you and not make you sick. But what is, I think, gathering all the attention and excitement now is that the prospect for broader application is emerging by several different advances in basic research, technology, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, electronic medical records, big data, mHealth, and I'll say a bit more about each of these. In 2011, uh, the National Research Council report on precision medicine, <coughs> which was a, a very thoughtful group uh, that was co-chaired uh, by Sue Desmond Hellman uh, and um, I've forgotten who the other chairs was, Charles Sawyers, excuse me, uh, and put forward what they saw as a unique opportunity here. And I think that also captured a fair amount of attention. And basically what was put forward then and which we now enforce, uh, reinforce uh, by the deliberations that have happened over the last months and which now I think has an opportunity to become a reality is we need to develop a rigorous research program to provide the kind of scientific evidence needed to turn this concept into reality. And importantly, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is not supposed to be some monolithic top-down enterprise uh, where mindless uh, instructions are put onto the shoulders of people to turn cranks. This is supposed to be an opportunity, just as the Human Genome Project was uh, 25 years ago, or as the BRAIN initiative is now for neuroscience, to recruit into this precision medicine initiative some of the best and brightest from multiple disciplines to join the team. Some of you in this room, people listening on the web, and other people who don't know yet that this is potentially going to be their most exciting career move, is to be part of this enterprise, because this will, I think, provide opportunities that have been previously unavailable. So the time is right, I think, uh, to say uh, that this uh, initiative could come together. It maybe hasn't been right until now in the United States. Between the advances in scientific knowledge, the advances in technology and computing, and certainly electronic health records, Americans' growing desire to be partners in research, a very critical part of why I think this is the right time, and the availability, because of the hard work that's been done by many organizations, uh, of existing research cohorts, which, if put together, uh, would end up in a circumstance where we could have a whole much greater than the sum of the parts, and we'll be talking about a lot, that a lot in the course of the next couple of days. So I would say the time is right now. Was it right 10 years ago? Well, somebody tried to say it was. Uh, this commentary uh, looks... Uh, a little, a, a little forward-looking, perhaps, in May of 2004, uh, when I wrote this piece uh, for Nature, and um, tried to make a case at that point uh, for mounting uh, such a cohort of half a million people. Uh, uh, let's say that this didn't necessarily land with uh, wild enthusiasm uh, on the uh, desks of people who might um, have had some interest in it. In fact, I would say it was... <laughs> fairly quickly considered as being unrealistic. So what, why is it right now, if it wasn't then, what's happened in the last 10 years? Well, here's a table that I think reflects some of the dramatic changes that have happened in those 10 years that really bring us now uh, to the possibility of doing this realistically for an affordable cost. Obviously, the cost of sequencing a human genome, uh, you could argue whether in 20, 
uh, 2004, that's the right number, but that's what the uh, current curves would say. It was about $22 million. Now we're down to, depending on who does the analysis and how much it's fully loaded and which machine you used, uh, something in the neighborhood of a couple thousand dollars. And time, of course, the sequence has profoundly dropped. We're going to talk a lot in this meeting about what an advance it is uh, to have smartphones uh, in the hands of individuals who will be part of this cohort, just as an a remarkably powerful way uh, to collect information, to communicate without having to pay for those phones because they're already there. And you can see the change there is truly dramatic in 10 years. Likewise, electronic medical records, uh, which were pretty scarce uh, back 10 years ago, uh, now in terms of providers, uh, percent uh, over 90 percent. And computing power, which we are going to need, uh, continuing uh, happily uh, to follow a Moore's Law curve, which uh, sequencing has outstripped, but it's a good thing that computing power continues on that curve, at least for uh, the present time. So put all that together, and you could say that my um, overly optimistic presentation in 2004 now seems like something that could really happen, and certainly that's the view the president has arrived at. So what's the vision? And we had lots of discussion about this over the course of the last year. And I'm actually very happy the way in which this has emerged as both a near-term and a longer-term component to this. I think the understanding of cancer on the basis of advances in genomics uh, has come a long way and yet is poised uh, for the next leap in terms of scaling up the enterprise. And hence, uh, it would be really a terribly unfortunate thing to leave out the opportunity to push forward cancer as a near-term part of the Precision Medicine Initiative. It is closest to the clinic, and we should grab onto it and embrace it and utilize this as a real success story that can get even more successful with this kind of additional push. But in the longer term, going beyond cancer to virtually all diseases, that can then leads to the need to have uh, lots of interesting technologies, pilot projects, and ultimately a large-scale cohort uh, to be able to test those out on. The proposed budget, which you heard about already uh, from uh, Kathy and Eric for FY16, and again, this is proposed. Uh, this is the President's proposal, which has now been delivered to the Congress, and the Congress will be deliberating over the course of the next months about whether they agree with this or not. And so there's no guarantees here that these funds will actually appear in FY16, but the, this is the opening bid. And for that uh, purpose, $215 million, 70 of that for the cancer component, 130 for developing the cohort, uh, 10 million for, food, for FDA, and 5 million for ONC. And again, all of this would start October 1st uh, of this year if the Congress uh, goes along with this and if we actually have a budget approved by October 1st, which would be nothing short of miraculous because we haven't had a budget on October 1st since I can remember. But <clears throat> sometime in the next you know, 10, 12 months, uh, we will have some idea what the Congress wants to do with this. I will say the initial reactions uh, from Capitol Hill are very positive about this as a unique opportunity. This has landed in a way that we hoped it would as a bipartisan issue where politics really shouldn't be the determinant about the level of support. Uh, basically, uh, it's an idea that uh, many people could embrace uh, as the next significant leap forward in terms of large-scale medical research. So the cancer part of this, which we are not here to talk about over the next couple of days, there's a separate track that Harold Varmus has organized through the NCAB, the National Cancer Advisory Board, uh, to figure out exactly how to put that part together. But we're interdigitating these efforts, and there are people here at this meeting from NCI. And we will continue to make sure we look for every possible intersection between that near-term cancer effort and the longer-term uh, cohort development, especially in the area of things like databases and patient involvement. So the cancer part will particularly take what we've already learned uh, about genomics from projects like TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, but scale that up to larger numbers of tumors to try to test precision therapies in, in a more systematic way for a wide spectrum of adult and pediatric cancers, and also to understand therapeutic response in ways that we have not yet really got a handle on, such as when drug resistance happens, why does it happen, and what could you do about it? What would be the opportunity for cancers where you have more than one actionable mutation in a particular individual's tumor to actually use combination targeted therapy instead of single drugs 
because we recognize that single drug therapy, while it can lead to dramatic responses, often then uh, down the line uh, results in a relapse because of uh, re uh, the resistance to the therapy. And combination therapies, just as with infectious diseases, uh, for cancer, you expect if you're going to really win the war, uh, that's probably what you need to do, and yet we've done relatively little exploration of that. And then also included in here will be a big push on non-invasive ways uh, to monitor whether tumors are recurring or not, particularly the liquid biopsy approach, which allows you in cell-free DNA uh, to assess whether a particular uh, cancer is coming back because you know what you're looking for at the DNA level. So there's going to be a lot going on there. This will be, I think, uh, highly rapidly moving and exciting science, uh, and it will be connected to what we're here to talk about, but we are going to talk here at this meeting about the longer-term effort. And here the idea is nothing less than to generate a knowledge base that will be needed to move precision medicine into the whole range of health and disease. That means we will need to support research to create all kinds of new approaches for detecting, measuring, analyzing a wide array of biomedical variables. And uh, that means a lot of technology development. Uh, that includes, by the way, and we'll be talking about that, uh, opportunities uh, to expand the mHealth approaches that use cell phone technologies for monitoring physiology and a wide variety of other parameters of people in real time. These will need to get tested, of course, in small pilot studies, but ultimately we want to be able to test this in greater numbers of people over longer periods of time with lots of different chronic uh, and acute conditions, and that means you need a very large uh, database a cohort of individuals who have agreed to participate as full partners in this effort in order to collect the data at the scale that you will want to have available. And that then leads us to uh, this opportunity uh, to develop a national research cohort. Uh, we are s saying that this should be a million. I actually am hoping it might be more, uh, especially when you consider the number of cohorts that have already been put together by a lot of people in this room and a lot of people who are not in this room which, if you stitch them together, can easily uh, go well beyond that number for individuals who have already agreed to participate in research, many of whom have electronic health record access, and many of whom have the beginnings, at least, of genetic analysis, some of them fairly extensive. But we will also want to make it possible for new volunteers to join up. We envision this as the national study of health. Who wouldn't want to be part of this? The participants must be centrally involved in the design and implementation of the cohort right from the get-go, and that's going to be a theme that we come back to over and over again in, in the next couple of days. This is not intended to be researchers telling uh, patients what to do. In fact, I'd rather we don't use the word patient uh, in terms of the people who are volunteering to make access uh, to their medical information available. They're participants. They're partners. They'll be able to share their genomic data, their lifestyle information, their biological samples, all linked to their electronic health records, and they will expect to get information back. Uh, this will provide scientists with a ready platform uh, for things that we cannot currently do, at least not at this kind of scale. Observational studies, interventional studies, all of this made possible by the fact that the consent allows recontact and participants can decide, if approached, whether they want to take part in a follow-up study or not. And again, tests of wearable sensors for monitoring health, which I think is going to be a very uh, interesting area considering all the applications that are being developed right now. Again, a new model for scientific research, engaged participants, open responsible data sharing, but with privacy protections and obviously a, a challenge to figure out exactly how to uh, meet all of those uh, definitions. So patient partnerships will be part of this, uh, electronic health records, technologies, uh, genomic uh, information, uh, huge challenges, therefore, in terms of the data sets that will be generated. This is going to require uh, huge uh, investments uh, to make sure that we come up with the right structures and the ability to mine them. So what would early success look like? People often ask, oh, this sounds great 20 years from now, but what are you going to learn in the shorter term that will justify this and will keep the enthusiasm level up uh, for participants and also for those who are uh, appropriating the dollars that this is going to need year after year. Recognize that $215 million that I talked about, that's one year. That's FY16. This is expected to be a project that will go on for many years 
and each year it will need to have support. So we'll need to be sure that the case is well made about why that support is justified. So one possibility that comes to mind is if you have, with a large number of individuals, already predetermined a genetic information, and we might talk about whether we could start, for instance, with SNP chip information before you go to whole genome sequencing, which is ultimately where you want to go, uh, you'd have a real opportunity to see whether pharmacogenomics works at scale in the real world. Uh, much of that testing has not really been done, despite the fact that FDA has on more than 100 labels uh, information about genotype that suggests it would be good to know this before you write the prescription. Logistically, it just hasn't been possible to do that, and so why not uh, use this as an opportunity to test that out for lots of different drugs. Could this actually improve outcomes? Uh, we need to know that. Uh, I do believe that we will discover by having a very large amount of phenotype and genotype and environmental exposure information uh, other examples that might be of great interest uh, to the pharmaceutical industry in terms of experiments of nature uh, that tell you that there's a particularly attractive drug target lurking in there. And I just mentioned two here that have already emerged uh, from other kinds of analyses, PCSK9, uh, which many companies are racing frantically to be first out of the box as the next major advance in, in treatment of hyperlipidemia and cardiovascular disease. And SLC30A8 uh, for type 2 diabetes, again, coming out of the study of human genetics but pointing to a drug target that otherwise probably would not have appeared for a very long time. There must be many more like this, but you need the kind of scale uh, that this enterprise will provide uh, to have full expectations of those emerging. And then this concept of resilience, uh, which uh, Steve Friend has been talking about, but I think many of us are excited about, where if you have this kind of phenotypic information and detailed genetic information on a million people, you're going to find some very surprising situations uh, where somebody appears uh, by DNA analysis uh, to have a particular disease, but they don't have it. Uh, somebody who has mutations in both copies of CFTR but doesn't seem to have cystic fibrosis. Or somebody has a presenilin mutation, but they don't actually have Alzheimer's disease, even though they're 65. Those are experiments, often small scale, maybe even N equals 1, but they have the potential to teach you some pretty interesting things about networks and also about possible therapeutic uh, interventions. But you need very large data sets to do this, and you need to be able to recontact the individuals who have those interesting genotypes and go through a much more extensive analysis of their phenotypes in order to determine uh, what's happened there. And as I've said before, and again, uh, for all of us who see the M Health uh, revolution happening and are pretty excited about it, yes, I'm wearing my Fitbit, uh, the opportunity uh, to evaluate what is an increasingly large array uh, of technologies to assess uh, various aspects of metabolism, uh, physiology, and human behavior are going to be, I think, extremely interesting, and this is going to be a great platform to test them. So that all sounds maybe a little bit general. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to give you a hypothetical example of what this might lead to uh, for a real person who decides to get involved uh, in this cohort. So this is a hypothetical case of a 50-year-old woman who has type 2 diabetes, uh, and right now, um, she might visit her doctor and uh, learn, as many diabetics do, that glucose control has been suboptimal, but just the same uh, renewing of the prescription and sort of additional advice about how often uh, to check your blood glucose with a finger stick and adjusting the doses. But nobody's particularly happy with this at the present time, I would uh, argue. Okay, uh, now suppose uh, two years from now, this national research network is up and going. Uh, she decides to participate in this. Uh, a sample of her DNA, along with health information, is uh, derived, included in the cohort. Analysis is carried out. And she is given opportunity to view her own health and research data, which can be, I think, a significant motivator for any of us uh, who have that opportunity. That has to be part of the plan here. So after a bit of analysis, oops. Uh, she uh, is approached by researchers uh, to see if she's interested in a particular kind of monitoring of blood glucose. Uh, it might be a tiny implantable chip. It might be one of these tattoos with micro needles that samples interstitial fluid. 
uh, but is able to determine in a uh, real-time ongoing way glucose levels, uh, sending those signals uh, to her watch and to researchers' computers uh, over the internet. And that information then gives her much more in the way of specific minute-to-minute -minute, uh, understanding of what's happening to her glucose. And it would be hard to imagine that wouldn't have an effect on medicine dosing and diet, uh, which she then does, potentially as soon as two years from now. Five years from now, new therapeutics are coming along for type 2 diabetes, uh, perhaps uh, based on, you know, SLC30A8 or some other thing, and there's a new drug. Uh, which uh, she is interested in trying out. And in fact, when she enters that drug's name into her smartphone, her genomic data, which she has access to, uh, shows that she's a slow metabolizer and therefore she shouldn't get the full dose. She ought to get an altered dose. And that's what gets done. I know this is hypothetical, but it's not out of the range, I think, of what we might aspire to. So, okay, we'll get her to age 60. Uh, she's, uh, at that point, uh, presumably uh, happy that she's participated in this uh, study. She's benefited directly by having access to some of these research tools, um, and her kids think this is a good idea, and, and they join on as well, and on it goes into there. So that's the kind of uh, image that I hope we could see multiplied like a million times. Uh, as this kind of enterprise gets underway, admittedly uh, based upon a great many assumptions about what we might be able to achieve uh, together. So finally, just to say why we're here and what we hope to achieve, all of you, I think, uh, came here with expectation uh, that we were going to have an intense discussion, and you're going to not be disappointed. Uh, we have representatives in this room from a wide variety of fields. We have many other people listening over the web and down the hall, there's an amazing control room uh, where all of their inputs are being synthesized by a team there with more computers and wires than I've seen in a while. And they will be fed into this room uh, in appropriate moments so that we can capture some of the questions that are out there uh, in the people who are watching. We have these major areas of focus, uh, which are uh, going to be covered in the uh, presentations that come next uh, by the four working groups that have already labored long and hard to get to this point, and my thanks uh, to them because that's been a lot of work uh, to put together those white papers and prepare uh, for today. And uh, going forward after this, again, uh, we will uh, very much try to capture the inputs of all of you. We will have that parking lot there uh, to capture things along the way and be sure we don't lose them, even if we can't cover all the topics directly in this meeting. Uh, you heard already that uh, one of the mechanisms uh, for going forward that we're going to use, which has been very successful for things <coughs> like the Brain Initiative, is a working group of my advisory committee. And that Rick and Kathy will be co-chairing that, and we will flesh that out with appropriate membership uh, not long after this meeting. We are, of course, looking at an opportunity to start something up or begin building uh, something in FY16, because that's where the dollars, we hope, will flow. <clears throat> but we need to use every minute of the time we have between now and then uh, to do the appropriate planning. And I would tell you, and I think it's come across pretty clearly, I don't know uh, many uh, answers to questions about how this cohort should be designed. It's not like we're coming here and we already know the answer and we just sort of want to uh, listen to you, but then we're going to go ahead and do what we planned. We don't know. And so your input is really going to matter. We may need to expand these four work groups that have already uh, started this process, but they may not be the only ones uh, that we need uh, to work on specific topics. I think, at least tentatively, we're going to need follow-up outreach meetings. A very important one will be with the participants represented here at this meeting, but we need a focused group uh, to look at that. Uh, we need, well, I think uh, an additional focus on the leaders of these current cohorts that we hope to be able to stitch together in this process, to hear from them about what they like about this and what works for them and what doesn't. <coughs> and I think we ought to be able to tap into some of the technology developer community and, and do an even more thorough job of assessing how that area of endeavor can intersect uh, with this big plan for a cohort. And all the way along, we will be coordinating with the White House and other agencies, and I'm quite sure the President will expect regular reports on our progress, uh, given what you heard about how committed he is personally to this. So that's what we're trying to achieve. 
Uh, again, uh, lots of information will be forthcoming just back again to this website, and that's what's up there right now, which is a description of what's there. Please point people to that who are trying to figure out what we're talking about. It will be the place where we try to deposit lots of information. And finally, I just again want to say thank you to all of you uh, for coming here, some of you on short notice, uh, to take part uh, in an open discussion of this sort. One of the things I've learned uh, initially coming to NIH to try to lead the Human Genome Project and more recently as the director of the whole place is that the success of our enterprise just really depends upon the willingness of uh, all of these bright brains that are out there uh, to come and give your best ideas to us and expect us to run with them. Uh, it's a very familiar quote for me that I'm fond of uh, from the guy who was actually born about a block away from where I grew up in Stanton, Virginia. That would be President Woodrow Wilson. I not only use all the brains I have, but all I can borrow. So we're all here to borrow your brains uh, for the next two days. I hope you don't mind. I hope yours are not Rubik's Cubes, as mine has been described to be. But out of this is going to come a very significant next step. One of many, uh, but I think launching this effort in a much more serious way than we've been able to say we were doing until we got to this meeting. So thank you again, all of you, uh, for spending your two days with us. And uh, we look forward to what comes out of it. I will stop there and say thank you and uh, turn this over to Rick Lifton, who is going to moderate uh, the next session uh, where we hear from these four hardworking working groups. Thank you all.